I use a stream deck to control all sorts of the devices in my studio, like the ATEM Mini, my HyperDeck recorders, OBS, and even the lights in my room. What makes it all possible is this open source software called Companion. In this video, I'll show you how to set up Companion on a Raspberry Pi and how to use it to control an ATEM Mini and other devices. Hi, I'm Aaron Parecki. You've probably seen me using a Stream Deck during my live streams, and I often do live demos of creating buttons to control things, but I've never actually done a full tutorial on how to set this up in the first place. If you use an ATEM Mini or any other streaming device, you probably realize that either you need to control things that might not have a physical button on the device, or you want to control it from farther away so that you don't have to have the ATEM right next to you. Like if you're filming a video podcast, you probably want the ATEM Mini out of the frame, especially because you'll have all the HDMI cables from your cameras going into it, and that just doesn't look great. So if the ATEM is way over there, you need a way to control it here. With Companion and a Stream Deck, you can run a single USB cable to the Stream Deck on your table and use it to control the ATEM at a distance. So before we get started, I wanna first talk about the difference between running Companion on your computer versus on a Raspberry Pi. You can run Companion on your computer if you want, but I actually prefer to run this on a Raspberry Pi for a couple of reasons. If you do run it on your computer, I recommend first quitting the Elgato Stream Deck app. That way Companion can take over the whole interface. But I prefer running it on a Pi so that it's a fully self-contained system. That way if my computer crashes, it doesn't take down the Stream Deck buttons too. It's also a much more portable system, especially if you pair it with a stand like this, which lets you mount the Pi underneath the Stream Deck. This is the Pro Streamer stand for the Stream Deck XL by inx 3 d I'll leave a link down below to where you can find it. It lets you put the Stream Deck on top and mount a Pi underneath, and it comes in a few different colors, white, red, blue, and black. So in this next bit of the video, we'll get a Raspberry Pi set up and the software installed. If you do want to skip this and test out Companion on your computer first, you can just skip right ahead to the part where we actually get into the Companion software using the chapters below. So if we're running this on a Pi, you can run it on a Pi 4B. You definitely don't need to run it on a Pi 5. A 4 will work great. You also don't need a lot of RAM, so I recommend getting a Raspberry Pi 4B with 2 gigabytes of RAM. I also highly recommend this fanless heatsink for the Pi, which also acts as a kind of case for it. It means it's silent and it does a good job of keeping it cool. I've actually had my Pi in this case turned on 24 seven for a few years now and it still works great. Okay, now that you have a Pi, grab a micro SD card. I'll leave a link down below to the SD cards I use. They are the SanDisk 16 gigabyte cards with the A1 rating, although it looks like I ran out of those, so this one's actually 32 gigabytes. But the main thing to look for is that you get an SD card with an A1 or A2 rating. Now we need to download the companion image for the Pi. Head over to bitfocus.io slash companion and log in to find the download link. Once you're logged in, go ahead and click on companion Pi. This is a complete Raspberry Pi image with companion already installed. I'll go ahead and download this, download the latest stable version. And in a couple seconds, this should be saved. Once that's downloaded, you're ready to write it to the SD card. To do that, download the application Raspberry Pi Imager, and that's available from raspberrypi.com. Once you've downloaded that, you can go ahead and click on Choose Operating System, scroll down here to Custom, point that at the Companion Pi image that you downloaded, choose Storage, which you will choose your 32 gigabyte or 16 gigabyte SD card, click Next, and here you'll get a chance to customize the OS settings. This is a new thing they added in a recent Raspberry Pi OS update, but this is really nice because it means you can go ahead and set your username and password and Wi-Fi info here before even booting up the Pi. So I am gonna go ahead and set a username and a password, and I'm gonna configure this to get on the Wi-Fi. Make sure you do select the right country for your Wi-Fi because that makes it use the right frequencies. I'm gonna go ahead and choose US. It's probably a good idea to set the time zone to your local area as well. Go ahead and click save, and we can click yes and yes again. And it's gonna go ahead and write this image to the SD card in just a few minutes. Great, and now we're done. We can go ahead and remove it from the reader and pop it into the Pi. The first time you turn on the Pi, you will probably need a keyboard and the monitor connected. So I'll go ahead and show you what it looks like when this boots up. So once you plug it in, the Raspberry Pi will finish its setup and reboot a couple times, and then eventually we'll show you a login page. Now, if you do have a keyboard and mouse connected, you can log into this, but it's just a command line interface and you won't need to do this going forward. The only reason you might need to do this right now is if you need to find the IP address of the Pi. Now, I actually would recommend connecting a Ethernet cable to the Pi so that you have a wired connection. It'll be a much more stable connection to all your devices. So before we can continue, we need to find the IP address of the Pi. One way to do that is to log in here with the user account you set up when you created the image. Depending on whether you connected a Wi-Fi or Ethernet cable, you can find the IP address of your, of your Pi by typing if config. So here we can see there's nothing plugged into the Ethernet. It's only got a Wi-Fi address WLAN 0 
and the address is 10.11.43.95. This is another thing that's gonna be different depending on your setup. So make sure that you look at the IP address because it'll get an address on your own network. If you do have the ability to set a static IP address in your router for this, I would highly recommend doing it just so that you don't get different addresses every time you start up the Pi. Once you found the IP address, you don't need the keyboard connected or monitor connected anymore. And we're gonna do everything else from a computer using the web interface. So I'm just gonna go ahead and take out the keyboard. And now I'm gonna plug in the Stream Deck on top of this. I actually got a short USB cable with a 90 degree adapter because that's gonna make it a little bit cleaner under here. So I'm gonna plug that end in here, do a kind of loop around and get this plugged into the Stream Deck on the back. So back on your computer, enter the IP address and port 8000 afterwards, and that will launch the web interface for Companion. That's gonna go look like this. We'll run you through a little setup guide first. We're not gonna do any of this advanced stuff yet. We can come back to that later. I'm gonna skip setting a password here too, because everything is just on one network here, a closed network, and nobody else has access to it anyway. Now we're actually ready to talk about Companion. So if you did install Companion on your computer, go ahead and click the launch button to get into the interface. If you installed it on a Pi, you'll have to type in the IP address into your browser. So let's do a quick overview of the interface of Companion. First, over here, we have connections. This is where we're gonna add connections to different devices that we're gonna control, like the A10 Mini. Here we have buttons, which is where we'll create the buttons for the actual Stream Deck. Surfaces is gonna tell you which Stream Decks are connected, and you can also add more than one, or you can even add a remote Stream Deck from a different Raspberry Pi or a different computer, which is a nice trick, but... We'll save that for a different video. Triggers are a fun feature, but it's pretty advanced. This lets you run actions based on feedback from other devices or even scheduled events. The settings tab has some basic settings. I actually always turn this one on first, which just switches the way the page up and but page down buttons work, which makes more sense in my head. I'll show you how that works in a second. Import and export is of course, if you want to import a from a previous companion config or export this to save, save a backup of it later. If things do go wrong, you'll find things in the log file, but hopefully you won't need that. First thing we're gonna have to do is actually set up a connection to an ATEM Mini. Let's say we have an ATEM Mini, so we'll go ahead and type ATEM, Blackmagic ATEM here. This is gonna bring you into this little configuration screen where you have to type in the IP address of your ATEM. It will try to auto discover them on the network too, which is a nice little trick. So I'll go ahead and click this one, ATEM Mini Extreme ISO. It will try to auto detect the model. If it doesn't work for some reason, you can also just tell it exactly which one it is. I know this is an ATEM Mini Extreme ISO, so we'll just go ahead and check that. Click Save, and it should get, give you a green check mark here once it's connected. Now, in order to actually make this work with a Stream Deck, of course, make sure you go to the Services tab, and if it didn't already pop up here, click Rescan USB, and that'll just search for any connected USB devices. You should then be seeing the blank companion interface here on page one with up and down arrows. This is where you can go to different pages. I, again, I like pressing down to go up in pages, which I guess now that I'm saying it out loud is backwards, but this makes more sense in my head. You can choose which way you want the page number buttons to go with that setting. If you press page one, if you press, press this page number, it'll always jump you back to page one. So no matter where you end up, you can always skip back to home there. Now that I have my ATEM connected, I can go ahead and make some buttons for it. So let's go into the buttons page and I'll explain how this works. This is your grid of buttons. Again, pressing page up and down will navigate between these different pages. You can create up to 99 pages of buttons, which is more than enough. Pressing this button will always jump you back to page one. So I like to treat page one as my main interface or even a sort of launcher interface. There's two ways to create buttons. You can click on an empty slot and create a button and then start adding actions here. You can give it a name like button. You can change the font and all that. But the other way to do it is by using presets. Presets will give you preset actions based on whatever devices you've got connected. So in my case, I only have one ATEM Mini connected. So it's showing me one option here. If I click on that, this will give me bu preset buttons for any of these actions. For example, I might want to use the program buttons and make a bunch of buttons that will immediately switch program to these different camera angles. So now I can just drag these in. So one quick way to build an interface for an ATEM is just to drag in your eight cameras, five, six, seven, eight. Maybe we add the super source as well as a media player. And you'll notice now that camera five is red. This is, this is called feedback. So over in the button actions, what this preset did was basically just create the button with steps and feedback already created. So the actual action that's being run here is the ATEM setting the program input 
to from ME1 to camera five. Feedback will change this button color, text, or font based on the state of the ATEM. So in this case, when camera five is on air, this button is now highlighted in red. I don't really like this color very much, so I usually end up changing mine to be a little bit more fun, but this is a default and it, it works fine. So now as I'm pressing these buttons, we can see we are changing the program input of the ATEM and the buttons are changing state to show which one is on air. So already you can see how much nicer this is to control the ATEM rather than pushing the buttons on the ATEM itself. But this is also really important because this lets you do things that there aren't buttons for on the ATEM. In order to demonstrate that, I need to go a little bit deeper into the actions on Companion. So if we go and make a new button down here, I'll make an empty button this time. And let's say you wanted to change what graphic was on the screen. There isn't a button on the physical ATEM to change the graphics in your media pool, but we can create buttons here for that. So let's make one here called title. And then under press action, I'm gonna go ahead and click this little folder and this will give us a, a menu of actions that we can search for based on what's connected. So here I'm gonna search for media and you can see there's a couple different media player options. Here we're gonna say set source. And now there is a, a press action here, which is setting media player one to this graphic. I'm actually gonna change this to, no, this is right, my channel art. And then we're gonna make a new button over here which is called RGB. And this will just be the, the red, green, and blue background. Now that I've created a media player set source action once, it shows up under the recently used menu. So now this is just a faster way to find that same button. So here I'll change media player one, and this one I'm gonna use the RGB background. And now it's set. So now as I toggle between these two buttons, you'll see the background on the image change from the little button presses that I'm doing here. This is already faster than digging through the menu on the ATEM software control. And of course, there isn't a button on the ATEM itself to do this anyway. The last thing I want to mention is the side menu over here. There's emulator and web buttons, which actually let you use the Stream Deck buttons you've created, but from the computer instead. So if you launch web buttons, you get a web version of the buttons you created. This is actually just scrolling down th through the pages, so it doesn't work quite the same as pushing the actual buttons, but you do get to just click on them here. This is actually great if you wanna load this up onto an iPad and have it as virtual buttons that you can carry around. And if your iPad is wireless, then of course it means you can be walking around the room controlling the ATEM from anywhere. I mentioned sometimes I use this first page as a launcher page to go to other pages. So that's actually something that I do pretty often. What I might do is actually create these buttons as my main ATEM controller on a different page, on let's say page two and then my home page will be a launcher to go to the different pages. I actually often create pages of buttons for specific tasks rather than as a generic controller, but I actually have a whole separate video I did on that where I did a deep dive on how my companion interface is set up. So I'll leave a link to that video down below. But really quick, I'll show you how to make this into a launcher page. Click on an empty button, click create button, and we can just say page two. And then on the press action in the library, it'll be an internal action. And it's actually going to be, if you want to, you can scroll to find it, or you can just search for page. And here we're going to say surface set to page. And this is going to jump whatever Stream Deck is being pushed to whatever page is selected here. So we'll choose page two. So now if I'm on the launcher page and press page two, it's going to jump me here. And of course, I can always go back to page one by pushing the page button here. So you can imagine you can very quickly set up this page as a launcher to go to any pages with for specialized tasks. I wouldn't recommend calling it page two. I would probably recommend calling it something like record or streaming settings or graphics, things like that. That way you can see where you're going to go when you push that button. If you've created a whole bunch of buttons on your companion after a while, you will probably want to make sure it's backed up. Again, you can go to the export tab here and you can just download a file containing all of the configuration that you've done. Go ahead and click that choose download, and that'll save a backup file on your computer with everything you've done so that you can always restore it in case your Raspberry Pi dies, or if you want to move it to a new computer. This is also a great way to go from a from trying it out on your computer to installing it on a Raspberry Pi later. So you can very quickly create that export file from your computer version and then import it into the Raspberry Pi version. I hope this video gives you some ideas of how to use a Stream Deck and Companion in your own live streams. Again, I'll link to a video which I did recently, which goes into a deep dive of how my companion is set up down below. And you are welcome to join me on one of my weekly live streams and ask questions if you have any more things you would like to see, or if you'd like me to experiment with something for you. As always, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.